Okay, so like I stated last class, if you can remember, because that seems so far away now. It's crazy how quickly last Wednesday feels when you're on Monday. But we had finished chapter two, and we did a little preface into chapter three. And what I had stated was, I want to kind of run through the concepts that govern chapter three so that we can start using our lecture session more like an in-class lab. And then I'm going to flip the classroom where if we focus on doing the lab content during the lecture hour, where I kind of walk through and I can explain the concepts as it appears in practice, then I'm going to become more reliant on you to actually read the book to see how to generalize the concepts we're going to actually be putting in practice in the class, right? There's always one of the difficulties when we have lecture. Do I want to show you how to do something and then you have to take the time to broaden the scope of it later? Or do I want to show you an abstract thing and then you have to actually learn how to use it on your own? So we're going to pivot and see what way works best, right? We spent a lot of the class doing a combination of abstract and then these tiny little practice examples. But I think with the data lab, uh, with the bomb lab, we'll, we'll be much more hands-on with that. But then I'm going to be relying on you to read the book to see the things that exist outside of what we actually do. So with that said, this lecture is still going to be a little bit of theoretical, just to make sure that we're, we understand how we tie into chapter two and how that ties into chapter one. Of course, chapter one is a non sequitur because that was a broad tour of a computer system at large. That was a very big picture view. And then we get very, we got very granular in chapter two because we really talked very, very deeply about how all the information that we can store, that we process on inside of a system, a computer system, can be encoded as binary strings and what the implications of that are and how important it is to provide a context and a set of operations on whatever format we chose. And we, we, took, we looked very deeply then on the very critical representations that drive the ability to thereby encode everything else, which was our integer data types and our uh, floating point data types. So now that we've hardened our knowledge on data representation in the form of binary representations, I want to now go up an additional level, maybe move from the mathematical perspective and start looking more at the engineering or the machine perspective. So now that we have all of these binary representations, how do we actually use them inside of the, the system? And not at an abstract level, like the idea behind this class is to build from this very low level binary representation and motivate up towards this abstract representation that we use in languages like C or C++ or Java or Python, right? But before we can do that, we have to go to the assembly level because all of our high level code kind of funnels down into a, a assembly representation, which in itself is still an abstracted view that's human readable and easy to uh, easy for us to author. That effectively gets assembled into machine code. And the machine code is what actually communicates with the ISA, the instruction set architecture and everything else that binds to the hardware to actually start moving and operating and manipulating our binary representations. And so that's where chapter three is. We're going to go from those binary representations and say, okay, a system now has to do things to move the binary data to, so that it can be processed. It has to process it. It has to move it. It has a lot of different operations to do interesting things with it. Because so far, all we've done was create a schema by which we can utilize, where we can start representing things. But now we have to build the hardware, the machinery, the mechanisms that can interface and, and, and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of instantiate it. Okay, and that's what this chapter is about. So we already kind of gave the preface, if you might recall, uh, last class. So a lot of this, I think is going to tie in 
to your assembly class, right? Because a lot of your assembly class was interfacing with the lower level portions of what drives our underlying system. So I'm going to probably try to run through a lot of the concepts inside of this uh, slide deck so that we can get to the more interesting lab component sooner rather than later. That's my goal, at least. We'll see if I can stick to it. Okay. Make sure there's no questions online. Perfect. Okay. So let's see here. So let's ask some quick motivating questions. We're talking about machine code now because, and by machine code, I want to distinguish between assembly and machine code, right? Our machine code is encoded by our encoded byte sequences that represent the low level CPU operations. And so uh, these byte sequences can be loaded in memory so that they're addressable. Uh, our key functions of machine code, the things that they have to be able to do if we're gonna be able to um, realize these byte representations and do meaningful things with them is data manipulation, memory management, input and output operations and network communications, right? So at the core, this is what our system needs to be able to handle for us to build on top of that and start doing meaningful things. So of course the role of our compiler then, and so just remember a compiler is just an application. It's a piece of software in itself that runs on our system, but a highly specialized piece of software that translates our high level code and uh, into machine code, right? Something that you should already know. It operates in stages and it considers a couple of things. One stage is it, it uh, considers the programming language rules at one end of the pipeline. And on the other end of the pipeline, it has to consider the machine instruction set. And so it has to tra translate from our programming language rules into something that can then be abided uh, by that can actually operate on our actual machine instruction set. And of course, every operating system is gonna have its own set of conventions. And so this can affect portability of code in very meaningful ways. One of the big advantages, again, about Java, and so this isn't, this is something, this is just one of the things that has been around for decades. So we take it for granted. But understand one of the reasons why Java became such a dominant language, as it were, was because of the JVM. The JVM allowed you as a software developer, as a software engineer, to target your platform for compilation to be the JVM. You'd have to worry if it was like a Unix system or a, micro, a Windows system or an OS or whatever the hardware was, right? It, at that time, it was Sun Microsystems. Now it's Oracle is the one responsible to, for ensuring that the JVM runs on all the hardware. And then you as a developer can extract away the complexities of having to ensure your code is compliant with a particular instruction set, and you just have to make sure it run, runs on the JVM. That's concept is portability. That's not always the case for other languages, right? Like C is a systems level language and there are implementations of C as we've already stated that might be able to execute, that might be able to run on one system and not another, or it might run differently on different systems based off of how they define the different primitive types. And we'll, we'll, we'll kind of touch briefly on why that might be the case when we look at a historical perspective of our hardware uh, architectures, our instruction architectures, which are like legacy bound and still influence the way we, like several decades later, like a generation later, maybe even two now, uh, still kind of code. And, and so some of the design philosophies that go into software that, what's that, that, that phrase, like standards never die, right? And so there's tons of examples where things that we build today are built off of standards that were created like decades ago, uh, centuries ago. Okay, let's see here. So of course, since we're using Unix inside of our class, the compiler we use is GCC. Everyone should already be familiar with it at this point. GCC is a great compiler. It can, um, we can go ahead and use it to assemble our code so that we convert it from a human readable version into our machine code. It uses an assembler to convert our assembly code to machine code and a linker to then take what's generated into an executable, right? We all know this, we went through uh, lab zero, 
where you actually go through the various stages of GCC. One of the important concepts, and I think there is, is highlighted in the other slide as well, is that there's effectively two forms of our executable like files. We have our object code, which are which is kind of disconnected, and they're all linked together into one executable file. And that's what we can actually then tell the system to go ahead and invoke. And so that's going to be the uh, the job of our linker. And just to highlight, we have our high level code. That's an abstraction from machine level details in languages like C and Java, our assembly level code. We can write low level instructions, but it's also a form of abstraction itself. But this is actually how coding was done in early computing. There, like for instance, if you ever played the original Nintendo, all the codes, all, all of the games that were developed for the NES was done in assembly. It wasn't done in a higher level language like C. Uh, I think that's true with the Game Boy as well. Uh, so, so we have it much, much nicer today than what developers had back then. In fact, they had to be incredibly resourceful back in the 80s and early 90s i guess in all of the 90s too but the 90s were a weird time where like every six months you were seeing your processor speeds literally double up like you kept wanting to hold off on buying a computer because you would get something twice as good <laughs> six months down the road and again the advantages of our um, high level language is it's more efficient for us to be able to actually generate code, right? It's easier for us to do more with less uh, and error detection too. It's easier to try to identify bugs, portability. If you write in a high level language, even, even those that are system level languages like C is gonna be way more portable than if you write in assembly. Assembly is designed, it's, it's the very definition of hardware specific. And so, and also mo modern uh, compiler optimization is a uh, another good use of high level coding. It's because our compilers are probably gonna be much better at optimizing our code than we could do if we did it by hand. And we can actually toggle the optimization level from our compiler itself. So there are flags we can pass for our compiler to say, don't optimize this at all for the purposes of debugging. Like things that optimize your code for, to, to run faster on your system is the same things we do uh, with optimizing our code for the web. Has anyone done any web development before? Is anyone familiar with the concept of minification of files? So let's just put it this way. Uh, I, I'll abstract the concept of what a good compiler optimizer can do in the way that a web server and a web client can communicate because the concept, the basis is relatively the same. So, um, Understand the way that your browser communicates with the internet is you have a web client and a web server. And so that concept of that server client relationship, as you probably recall from object oriented programming, where one object can act as the client and the other is a server and the client makes a request to the server and the server responds back to the client. It's a request response model. That's the very definition by the way that web applications work, that web clients to web servers work. So a web server just sits around and waits for a web client to make a request. And when it makes a request, it responds to the re that request and that's it. It's, it's like a handshake. It's like the web client says, the web, the web client always initializes, right? It always initiates. So the web client's like, hey, I need this thing. And the web server's, there it is. And then that's, and then if the web client needs something else, it makes another, initiates another request. And then the response disengages, it breaks that relationship. Okay, so with that said, let's say the web client wants a web page. That web page could be an HTML page with CSS and images and probably some JavaScript attached to it as well, right? So if you're unfamiliar, the kind of launch point for everything that's a web application is an HTML file. The HTML file contains instructions on everything it needs to properly load. Things that can load are the styling instructions that's held in your CSS. It could be your uh, the programmatic components of the web application. That's 
inside of the client, you actually have a runtime environment that's called, uh, it's a JavaScript runtime environment that runs in all browsers, regardless of what the browser you have is. And so your HTML page can also include JavaScript files. Now, when you go and load a web page from a web, or when you transmit files, data from a web server to a web client, all of the text inside of that file is takes up space. It makes the file larger. The larger the file is, the more data has to be transmitted from your web server to your web client. The more data that has to be transmitted from your web server to your web client, the longer time it takes, which can create a load that the end user can see. So developers want to optimize that transfer so it's invisible to you, the end user. So what are mechanisms by which you can reduce the latency of data transfer from the web server to the web client? There's lots of things they do, right? Caching is one. Web caching. If you've been to a site already, it can save a lot of the stuff. Guess what? We do caching in the hardware system as well. Same concept. Okay. Let's see other things we can pull from our web application kind of knowledges. Um, okay, so if we know that you have to transmit, if every character takes up space inside of a JavaScript file, and you can have a huge JavaScript file. So like when you start talking about web applications, like Google Drive, for instance, or like any real modern uh, web application, like web, web page is really a web application. So if you go onto like Facebook or TikTok or YouTube or Google Drive or Office or whatever, right? All of these are applications that run inside of your browser. And so that's going to load a lot of JavaScript files into your client side. So what's it mean to minimize? Well, as a developer, I'm probably going to give really good readable names to all my variables and functions, right? But guess what? For every character that I add to my variable name, for every character I add to my function name, that's X amount more space I have to transmit from a web server to a web client that doesn't affect the actual execution of my software in any way, right? Those names are for me as a developer. They're, they're for you as developers to read what I've done or to debug what I've done. But when it comes time to actually execute, the system doesn't care if it's a one letter function name or a 64 letter function name. But I'll tell you what, it takes a lot less time to transmit a one letter function name than a 64 letter function name. So a minimizer will go ahead and recompile or retranslate the JavaScript files and minify them. It takes the human readable variables, the human readable functions, and it makes them one letter, two letter, right? It, it makes them as small as possible. It removes all the spaces. It removes all of the tabs, it removes all the, all that's just stuff for us not need it to actually execute. And guess what? Now you take a big file and you've optimized it to compress it to be very small so you can easily transmit it from a web server to a web client. Okay, so that's very important when you have issues regarding latency, trying to get things as quickly as possible. Well, guess what? Our GCC compiler can do the same thing. We can either opt, we can tell it, we don't want any optimization. Why might we not want any optimization? Because maybe we want to debug it. The same reason why we might not want to minify all of our files, right? We might want to have a non-minified version so that we can read it. But if we know that we're just going to run it and it's just going to execute and we want it to be as quick and as fast as possible, then we can tell our compiler, compress it, optimize it. Okay, let's talk about some motivations to learn machine code. Uh, obviously, the significance is it's a pretty essential thing if you want to consider yourself a serious developer, right? So like if you want to exist just at a certain particular level where you are like creating web forms and you're working in frameworks and you're working on top technologies other people have built for you and you don't have to have a deep knowledge of how computing works then that's fine, right? But that's gonna be a very surface level knowledge you're gonna have. If you want to take the craft of computer science, of software engineering, of software development as a, as a 
deep skill, then you should understand how your high level code translates into low level code, translates into machine code, all the way down to the logic gates. Because that has real implications for security and optimization and for error detection as well. Because it's incredible how someone who has a deep knowledge of the entire vertical of our architecture is able to identify weird bugs. And I think this is just what these are saying. Your benefits, understand compiler optimization, your runtime behaviors, like how concurrency works or how data sharing works or how vulnerabilities can manifest inside your code. And again, in this chapter, really the emphasis here, and I think I stated this last time, is we want to shift away from writing and reading assembly to being able to understand compiler-generated assembly, right? Because most assembly instructions that are generated aren't done by humans. It's generated by software. And so you should be apt at reading assembly that, because in actuality, that's, that's, that's your biggest use case for using assembly. Like it's very rare is the time that you're going to be an embedded systems developer where you have to program directly on the hardware. There's like, there's still jobs like that available. If you're like developing for NASA or if you're working for, uh, uh, for on airplanes, for instance, you don't want that overhead necessarily of having to compile down. So there are still embedded developers that work at the assembly level. That's not most jobs. Most of the time, what you as a developer need in terms of assembly li uh, uh, literacy is in debugging. And what's generating the assembly from the debugger? It's the compiler. It's, it's your debuggers. Again, this is just emphasizing that concept, the distinction between handwritten assembly and compiler-generated assembly. The idea behind the compiler-generated uh, gen assembly is that it's going to be more abstract. It's going to be generated based off of programming rules, which makes sense. Uh, whereas our handwritten assembly is direct, often optimized for specific tasks. It can have comments in it. It can have well-defined names. So when you transition to machine code, and this is probably something that you're already aware of, you can understand how common C constructs like loops and conditions can transform into machine code. I'm, I'm assuming that's what you actually did in assembly, was take common constructs on, oh, this is the high level language of an if statement. This is how we can create labels inside and then, and then jumps to go and effectively perform selection statements or uh, loop structures or things like that. Uh, procedural calls. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the current dominance of machine languages. And this is something that the book states and it's rapidly changing in today's environment, right? So um, this is still relevant now. I don't know how much longer it'll be relevant. Uh, x86-64 machines are like, they power still most laptops unless you have a MacBook, in which case they don't. Um, lots of servers and data centers though are still empowered by uh, x86. So that's really important for security implications. But we're, we are seeing a huge surge right now in ARM-based uh, 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 um, systems. And so it should be interesting in the coming years to see how, if that, if, if the larger data centers also start adopting some of these ARM uh, processors, instruction sets versus the x86-64. But as of now, this is still really relevant. And I don't think it's, I think Intel has too much invested in the game to not try to maintain some dominance in a market that's super valuable to them. Really, the ones to watch right now is going to be, I think, the uh, the GPU sector, like NVIDIA right now, incredibly explo exploding because of their CUDA architecture, which is all, all of the really big, not just graphics, but AI stuff is built on, and optimized on top of uh, GPU uh, architecture. Okay, let's talk, though, about our evolutionary journey, about where, how we got here. So in terms of the assembly that you learned how to code and that we're used for 
our Unix systems as well. It uh, began in 1978 using 16-bit instruction sets. So, and of course, we've expanded that to 64-bit today, right? We're still at 64-bit currently. It seems to be very large, large enough for us to do whatever we need. It's not as limiting as it was in the 70s and 80s and even 90s uh, as we move from 16 to 32 to finally 64. So again, the modern interpretation of why this is important is, well, we still live with the growing pains of what was decided in 1978 with 16-bit architecture and the instruction set that governed all that. And, and so the way that we interface with that today is going to be with GCC and with Linux, which is going to sidestep for us a lot of these uh, legacy complex things. Okay, so let's see here. We already know the relationship between C and assembly. Uh, I'm packing data represent. Okay, so in terms of x86 and 64, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, the data representation. We'll talk about that later in the slides and also how we can implement things like our con uh, control, uh, control constructs, our procedures and our data structures. We'll be very brief with this because I think that's what you should already be familiar with with the uh, assembly. That should be the machine code concepts, the assembly code concepts that you're carrying into the class. And then some runtime considerations, obviously are gonna be memory referencing challenges, address uh, addressing buffer overflow vulnerabilities, and just tips for effective debugging with our uh, debugger, our new debugger. Okay, again, these are, I think, always the complexities people have when you drip, uh, drop, uh, drop down into the assembly language. And again, we talked about floating point in terms of its binary representation, but understand what drives floating point computations and representation is actually something that's at the hardware level too. It's not just this abstract concept that is a binary encoded concept. So we'll look at that briefly as we go through this historical perspective. So a quick overview here, we go from an 18-bit microprocessor, right? And so that effectively evolves us to our advanced operating system support that we now have today. And so this evolution is obviously driven by our technology improvement. Our processors got better, RAM got better, cheaper, much cheaper, right? So we can build better things, smaller and faster. The ability to produce these transistors at smaller and smaller engineering levels allowed us to cram more and more things onto chips that are smaller and smaller. So it's, it's, it's incredible what engineering has been able to do in the last several decades. Because before we had the microprocessor, we were forced to do everything with vacuum tubes. Right. And it's hard to build small things with vacuum tubes. They take a lot of space. Okay, let's talk about the key milestones inside of the evolution of the Intel processor. So we already stated that in uh, 1978, you had your initial 16-bit microprocessor. It was the 8086. 86 is going to be the like legacy term that moves forward and forward and keeps rolling generation after generation of these processors. So this was the basis for the original IBM PCs and uh, MS-DOS. And then you had your 8286. So you had your 8086. Then the next advance advancement was, and so notionally, you could typically drop the 80 off. So you could call that the 286, the 386, the 486. Anyway, so with the 8286, this added some more addressing modes. So it was a incremental change from the 8086, but the 386, which came out in 1985, was a significant change. That's where they doubled the addressable space. We went from a 16-bit microprocessor to a 32-bit microprocessor. This means that you can now double you the size of the byte sequences that can be encoded. This was very significant. And then in 1989, you had improved performance. And then you start at, at the same time, that's where you start to integrate the floating point unit. So up until that point, you did not have floating point units 
built into the machine. And then starting in 1993, you had the Pinium series, which brought in an entirely new instruction set and expanded that from the 486. And then finally, in 2006, you had your core series, which brought in concepts like multi-core processors and hyper-threading and all the other new technologies that allows us to get more and more out of these, uh, out of our, our chips that we have in our instruction sets, at, at the instruction set level. Which of course has huge implications on being able to program concurrently or concurrency programming. Now, the big thing about this is it's all backwards compatible, right? So the standards that were put in place kept carrying on. We're going to see that in a moment in how we're able to access or even name our register spaces. And so that does produce some artifacts. We can kind of get some strange remnants of the instruction set due to this evolu evolutionary heritage. Um, let's not leave AMD out the equation though. Right? We focus a lot of Intel and what they brought to the scene, but AMD is the major competitor to Intel in terms of being inside that, uh, inside that microprocessor space. Now, for the longest time, they were lagging behind. Like um, if you had an AMD in the late 90s, early 2000s, that was the cheap computer, right? Like that was the knockoff alternative that you would buy if you couldn't afford an Intel machine. But they really started to invest heavily in their R&D and they really went into an arms war with Intel at the uh, beginning of the, uh, the 21st century, weird to say. Um, and so actually, they brought a lot of innovations that Intel did not to the market. They were the first to surpass one gigahertz speed, which was a big thing. And they were also the one who, more importantly though, they were the ones to introduce the x86-64 instruction set, which Intel themselves adopted. So keep in mind, up until this point, one reason why Intel was so dominant was they're the ones who defined the instruction set. Clearly their competitors can use it, right? It was effectively like an open source instruction set. Uh, uh, kind of, but um, but it, it explains why they had such a dominant position. So let's talk a little bit about terminology. IA32 refers to Intel's 32-bit architecture. Intel 64 was Intel's branding of their 64-bit extension off of IA32. However, you probably commonly see x86-64 also referred to as AMD 64, this was the AMD 64-bit extension to the x86 architecture, which Intel itself adopted. And of course, whenever you see the x86, think back to the 8086, that's the lineage. You drop the 80 and usually everything's referred to that 86. And then just whatever the placeholder is there. Okay. Enough of historical. The entire point of that is that this is where our instruction sets come from. And so we have a lot of artifacts that have built up over the last 40 years, right? I, going on 50 years, right, of this microprocessor design that's been very influential and dominant inside of the market. So if we want to be real about systems and system design, system development, how our systems run, we should really take a look at the instruction sets that were put forth and developed and cultivated under this under under this evolutionary sequence that we probably grew up alongside, right? Okay, so in terms of programming codings, uh, we already know about compilation. We'll look more at the compiler options that kind of talk about optimization level that we're, we were discussing in terms of web servers, the compilation process and machine code forms. We're gonna run through this because I think we've talked about this ad nauseum. Okay, so we already know the purpose of compilation, right, transforms our human readable code into something that's executable on our system. Uh, one of the advantages of writing a C program is that it allows us to subdivide our software across multiple files and the compiler can stitch our files together into one executable. That is awesome. That allows us to break our code into manageable parts. The compilation process uses GCC, 
we feed it our C code, it spits out our, 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 our object code, our executable code. And so the important part here is if we want to control our optimization level, this is the flag we would use. This dash O for optimization, the, 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 the various types we might want to use. We already know what GCC is. We've already stated that we can compile our C and C++ code. There's other, other languages too that you can use for it. Uh, if I hadn't stated before, it stands for new compiler collection. So it's a collection of compilers. And these are op optimization levels. So uh, OG is uh, what we would use if we wanted to do debugging because that doesn't optimize the executable at all. So it will maintain things like your human readable functions, which is going to be important for things like maybe bomb lab. If we want to be able to go ahead and read things that are human readable. Now, uh, if you do dash 01, that's going to give a moderate level of optimization. And then dash 02 would do very aggressive optimization. So really the takeaway here is you want to choose your optimization level based off of your project needs, your debugging needs, and what your maximum performance needs are. Quick overview on our compilation step. We go from our C preprocessor to our compiler, to our assembler, to our linker. Our, proce our C processor just prepares a source code for compilation. It effectively expands all of our preprocessor directives like hashtag include or hashtag define and replaces those macros with their actual values or expressions. And so what we get, uh, the result of that is a preprocessed source code file, st still human readable, just replaces all the hashtags out. Then we go into the compilation process. This translates our source code to assembly code. So here, the syntax and semantics are checked. Our code optimization is based off of the flags that we go ahead and select. And then what we're going to get from this is our assembly files, our .s files. So here, what, what, we're, what we're doing here, though, is we're illustrating that we're flowing everything from our high-level human crafted source code files into what's going to be our machine code. And then when we get to our machine code, we're going to actually look at what moves that around with our binary representation. So let's step down another step. We have our assembler stage where we convert our assembly code into the binary code. This translates our assembly instructions, which are still human readable, into the machine instructions, which as we've already shown, are hexadecimal representations that exist in memory that the system parses and say, ah, I do this operation in response to that. Everything's based off of context. And it resolves symbolic names to memory addresses. And so that's going to be our object code files that we get. And then finally, we have to link our various multiple object files and libraries. This resolves external references between object files and it combines the necessary libraries so that we can actually bring everything together to execute. And of course, then what that means is there's two types of machine code that exist inside of our system. You can have object code, that's your .o files that aren't linked, but they're all linked together. It creates what's called an executable uh, file or an executable code. And so this object code is our intermediate step in the compilation process, while executable code is the end product ready to run on our system. And so we've already seen this before. These are our .o files. And so this is going to be our binary code ready for execution. We can just run that straight from our shell or from our system, launch it, and then it can do things. So all of our symbols and addresses. So what's what does that mean? That means that all of the symbols and addresses are resolved. When we execute it, it knows how, what to do inside of our system to do that thing. It, it's combined all the necessary libraries. It's directly interpreted by the processor itself. It can be fed to the processor. So again, the process of this is generated by the linker, merging our multiple object files and libraries. So a little bit about machine level code. There is abstraction machine level programming, right? We've talked about this before. That's what the distinction between assembly versus machine code is. Assembly allows us to represent, and actually to a degree, machine code as well, allows us to be able to represent things like the processor state and memory model, right? Those are the, when we start talking about how can we actually, how can we actualize binary representations? What are the two things the actual hardware has to do 
to be able to make that occur? Well, we need to have the processor state, which is responsible for operating on everything. We need a way of understanding what state it is and get it to get into a state that we need it to, to operate on something. And then where do we store all the bi binary representation that has to be in our memory model? So we need a ability to hold things and we need a, a, an, act, an actor to act on it. And so here, this is going to be allow us to have our execution characteristics and we're enabled by our virtual address space. So what represents our processor? How, what is that abstraction? Well, our instruction set architecture, our ISA, defines our processor state. So this is what is created by Intel or AMD, right? This is when you learn assembly, this is the instructions that you're learning that tells the processor what to do at each statement. And there's very primitive instruction sets that you can tell the processor to shift from state to state to process your binary representations. So this defines our processor state. It gives us our instruction formats. This is why we have different Instru uh, instruction sets architecture is in the name, right? But this is why different processors have different instruction sets. This is why your MASM code can't necessarily run in MIPS or your MIPS code might not be able to run on an ARM architecture, right? Because whoever's designing the ISA gets to decide what the keywords are. And then also it's going to affect, it has effects on the state of the processor itself, right? You're giving it statements you're, to execute. And then again, you have your sequential operation. So ISA like um, x8464 defines instructions as executed in sequence. So this idea where you have a sequence starting with the topmost statement and you kind of trickle down is how we also go ahead and execute our state by state instructions to our processor. And so then the actual hardware might execute concurrently, but ensures ISA sequential behavior, right? So these processes are so quick, it can actually run things multiple times, but then it'll ensure that things are actually executed in the order that you intend. And so that brings serious implications of how does the system do that? That's gonna probably be something that you're gonna learn more about in OS. When, when talking about how to sequence things, especially in modes of concurrency. Okay, we already talked about virtual addresses, why this is so prolific for us. We don't want to have to manually be able to manage every RAM module or that we have access to. We want to put it all in one giant pool and be able to uh, simple, simplify our memory addressing and management that way. So again, another abstraction. Assembly code is just a text representation. It's easy to read. We already know this. Our machine code exposes parts of the processor state that's hidden in C such as our program counter, right? We don't get access. So just like C exposes things that is hidden in Java, the idea of references by pointers is kind of disguised to us in Java, right? The way that uh, garbage collection is done is hidden from us because of Java. Java takes care of dangling references. If we don't have to deallocate memory in Java, right? If we stop using an object, the JVM clears that up for us. It doesn't just create a memory leak inside of our system like it would in C, where if you forget to release your memory, it's going to potentially cause an issue if the application runs too long. Segment, segmentation faults. Big thing you'll see in C. Has anyone come across those yet? We'll probably see some during um, Tiny Shell Lab, I would think. Okay, so of course, like this is our going to be our instruction pointer. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about our processor state and our memory model. So when I say processor state, is everyone kind of familiar with the concept of like a finite state machine? Have y'all talked about that at all? So many things can be modeled as finite state machines. So as... So what's that? Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So so if you think about state as like a finite state machine, which you probably went over in uh, theory of computation. Um, yeah. So the idea is that like your processor can have multiple states and we can 
cause the processor to shift from one state to the other with an action, right? We, we give it an instruction that makes it do a particular action. So what are the different states that our processor can have? Well, we have the program counter. This is gonna indicate the next instruction to address. You use the program counter, I'm assuming in assembly, right? So you're probably already familiar with that. Just, so this is just a refresher on that. You have your register, your, your integer register files. So inside of um, uh, x86-64, we have 16 name locations that store 64-bit values, right? So these are important spaces that we can hold data that gets fed directly into the processor. You have your condition code registers. This holds status information from re register operations, like did an overflow occur? These are like your flag values. And then you have your vector registers. This is gonna store multiple integers or floating point values. So you have some registers specifically designed for floating points, some specifically designed for integers, some for the conditions on giving a context of a binary string. What are the flags for it after an operation? And then where is the program counter in terms of where we're at in executing things, right? Everyone's familiar with these four concepts. And again, if we can model this state, then we can do a lot in terms of controlling the hardware to do things at a software level with the representation of our binary forms. Now, let's talk a little bit about memory in our, in our machine code. So it's seen as a large byte of addressable array, which makes it easy for us. The actual representation is an, an aggregate data type like arrays and structures, which are contiguous bytes of collection. So we'll see more about this, but we'll, we'll clear that up a little bit in a slide or two. So our uh, program memory components contain our mach contains machine code, our OS information, our runtime stack, our user allocated memory blocks. This is all the stuff that's going to be in our program memory at any given time. The virtual addresses that are used for addressing, and only a certain set of ranges are valid. And this is controlled by the OS. So the OS is the gatekeeper for anything that's memory addressable. That's on purpose. That's one of the roles of the OS for a number of reasons. Okay, some elementary operations. We have our machine instructions. They perform the very simple tasks like addition, data transfer, or conditional branching, right? Those are the primary concepts that's going to drive us to do anything interesting. So if we want to think about computer systems as like uh, a biological evolution, right? Now we're starting to talk about like starting to build our little unicellular and multicellular creatures that allows us to evolve it into these much more complex organisms. Oh, hang on. Let me see. I have some questions in the chat. <laughs> yes. AMD deserves to be roasted every now and then. Okay, let me see. Let's jump over here. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about some code examples. And we'll do this in the boring way, but the quick way, because I don't want to spend too much time actually fiddling around with altering any code because I want to get more into effectively the bomb lab sooner. So suppose that we have this C code. Right, and suppose that this is inside of a file called mstore.c. This is pulled directly from the book, by the way. So I think this is a uh, pretty close to the book demonstration. The idea here is that you can go from C code to assembly code to machine code. Then we can go from machine code back to assembly code. Then we can kind of predict what the C code looked like. From that process is what's called reverse engineering, which if you're interested in, they do have classes for that. Which is useful for a number of reasons, not just debugging what's happening with code, but it huge implications for cybersecurity. Okay, so let's suppose we wanted to generate our assembly code. Then what we can do here is when we run our GCC compiler, we can include this flag dash OG to avoid any optimization so that we maintain the kind of human readability 
uh, component of this. And so this dash S allows us to do this on a, um, on, we'll, we'll do this with our um, mstore.c file. And that's gonna generate our mstore.s file. And with that, then we could effectively inspect. And since we didn't compile it, we would still get our um, whatever function names we have in there. And then we could actually see what the ins uh, assembly instructions are. And we'd see how these assembly instructions actually perform this operation here. Like there's a one-to-one -one analog with that. Did you all do any of that in assembly, like translate between C code and assemb uh, assembly code? I, I think we already did that in class, in this class a couple of times, right? And then of course, once you have this representation, then that itself here gets encoded into our hexadecimal encoding, which is actually used by the system itself under the context of a program representation to actually feed these instructions to the instruction set architecture to change the state of the processor to actually manage these calls. And of course, then this would just live in memory somewhere. Okay, so suppose I wanted to do the reverse though. Instead of having my C code and generate the ability to read the assembly, the .s file, our assembly code from the, the compiler, suppose I had my object code. So now it's, it's in a machine code state and I wanted to bring it back up to an assembly code state then I could use a different application for that, which you're already familiar with. I think you use this inside of lab zero, object dump, right? So object dump allows us to convert machine code or machine code file back into an assembly format. Now, the interesting thing about this is that now you get to see the additional fluff that the machine generated uh, assembly creates. So like I like we stated earlier, once you once you hit that object code, once you hit that executable file, that now includes everything like the memory addresses that have to be resolved for your system to actually execute. So when you look at an object dump log, it's going to show you things like memory addresses and where in memory are these instructions at. So when you tell it to launch, it's going to jump into the system to launch that. But in, in addition to the uh, memory addresses, which would be on the far left column, it would also have the hexadecimal representation at those memory addresses, which are the instructions that are encoded for managing your, pro, your processor states to tell the processor how to shift from one state to the next that represents your executable file. Then it translates that into your actual assembly instructions, which is now human readable enough for you to understand it. Does that make sense? So you see the, the granular levels of what's happening here. Where in memory are, are these instructions fed at? What is the machine code representation that is meaningful directly to how we abstract the processor state and manage the processor state and, and, and memory state here, memory state, processor state, and then finally for us, the human readable version of that, which is our assembly which then we could translate if we're sufficiently capable enough back into C code. Now, some little artifacts that you might get from this GCC generated code is suppose for instance, um, your disassembler might output something like push and then onto this register, right? Uh, percent RBX. So, Whereas your GCC might generate this as a push queue, quad word, right? Because that's a 64, that's a quad word register space, right? 64 bit register space. So sometimes the GCC will be more specific about the bit vector size, whereas the disassembler is not. These are small nuances you're gonna see when you read different 
program or computer generated assembly. Because both of these are software that generates assembly, but they use different rule sets, right? One is really dedicated towards optimization, right? That's our GCC. Whereas our disassembler is really designed more for us to try to parse and read it. Our, well, it's going to strive to create something readable for us. And there are some really, really impressive uh, 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 debuggers out there and some disassembly tools out there that can make good predictions about what the actual C code or high level representations are. And again, what we have here generates an executable. We already know how to generate an executable of a program. And then just like we can object dump an object code file, we said there's two different machine code files. The reason why we stated that is to illustrate we can use object dump, uh, dump on both our, our executable files and our object code files. And again, if we look at, now the distinction is look at the difference between the sample output. That's that's the big takeaway here, is here we have less information because this hasn't been linked and fully resolved. So when you look at your memory address space, it's very abstracted to zero and one. It's more like offsets of where the instructions fall, right? Whereas once it's linked, it's actually going to get resolved to actual memory address on the left side, right? So at the machine level, you can really see what's happening that's different between an object code file and the actual executable file. The actual memory addresses aren't just an offset that's ready to get linked into some other uh, by, uh, executable binary file. It's actually been resolved to be a, a hardened address that exists inside of our system memory. And again, this is going to be the same. This is still going to be hexadecimal representation. This is going to be the same as well. But it's this left column here, the far left column, that's going to be a difference between our object code files and our executable files. And again, that's due to our linker. Our linker is the thing that fills the function to all the call addresses. And potentially other memory uh, optimization stuff. Okay, so what are challenges of assembly code that's generated by these pieces of software? Human readability, right? Not guaranteed to be readable, it can be very difficult. It can hold extraneous information. So you have to understand when we assemble something into machine code, when you're linking it, the reason why I want to show you the binary file versus the object code file is there's a lot of stuff that has to happen to make it actually run on your system, like resolving memory addresses. And a lot of times it pushes things like whenever you have a function call, it's going to push things onto the stack to make sure that the thing that called it doesn't lose its values and it's going to recall that stuff from the stack. And there's all these patterns that happen that you don't necessarily encode in the instruction sequence, but the, the system does. And you have to, if you want to read the assembly code and you're like, why is this push happening? You have to understand what those patterns are on how the system is priming and prepping for a procedure call to happen. And we're going to look at that and examine that when we do, I think, the bomb lab. And then finally, there's a lack of descriptions. It's not going to have any comments. So we lose that connection to what that original source code file was. Even if you authored it, you might not be able to read the assembly code version of that. OK, so just, a, just to highlight what this might look like, we looked at what mstore.c might look like if we had gone ahead and uh, compiled it, but uh, in kind of a shortened way, but th these are examples of all like the extraneous stuff it might add into there. All these like dots are assembly or linker directives inside of here, where uh, the file and the text and a mold store and all this stuff we don't care about, right? That's not actually affecting the instructions in the software itself. It's all metadata related towards the system, being able to manage the application for it to run. Okay, let's take a look at this annotated assembly just for a little bit of clarity. Suppose we have this function in C, this function 
has a void, so it's not returning anything directly. It's going to call mult store. I think this is short for multiplication and store it in some variable that we're going to give you access to. That's the point of the name. Uh, it's going to have a long X. It's going to have a long Y. So presumably we're going to take an X. We're going to take a Y. We're going to multiply them together. And guess what? We're going to store the resulting multiplication at this destination, which we're given the memory address to, right? We're given a pointer to a long that represents the destination of this multiplication. Okay, with that said, how does our parameter space in C connect to our register spaces in assembly? And so when we have these like procedural calls, when we have these function calls, X would map to the RDI, our destination uh, register. Y would map to our RSI, that's our source register. And then the third parameter here would be our RDX. And that'll represent our, our register. So you start to see, that's my point, is you start to see these patterns. When I have these three parameters in, in, in my C code, I can know what registers are going to be consumed by that. So important thing is, you can't have something important in that register if it's going to get overridden when you make this function call. If there's something in RDX, it better get pushed onto your stack so you can recall it after you're done processing this function. Right, you're probably really familiar with that with assembly. That's one of the big keys about assembly is constantly having to man manage what's in your registers before you do any key operation. Make sure you save anything that's important so you can recall it for later. It's a lot of management, but some people really thrive and love that that part of it. Some people hate it. <laughs> anyway, so if we were to annotate this, what we could say is these would be the instructions where we are, we're pushing RBX. We're going to move a quad word, our RDX, our destination, onto RBX. Recall that when we do our multiplication, we're going to go ahead and get our result into our probably RBX. We're going to call the mult2, which is calling this external function, and then we're going to return out. Because since we've set this destination to where the result of this multiplication is going to go to, it's going to get the result, and then we can just leave. So you can see this is effectively our comments for these instruction sets here. And this should be very similar to something you've already looked at at assembly. But being able to read this, seeing this and reading this is going to be a very, very valuable skill set when we hit bomb one. So again, why we're kind of taking this little tour of our machine code. Okay. Now, let's talk about our data formats that are available to us at the machine level, which you should already be familiar with. We've already talked at length about what our data formats are at the higher level language of C, let's see how that tethers to our machine code representation. So this all has to do with the evolution of our 8086, our 16-bit microprocessor. So a originally, right, if 16-bit was the size of a byte vector, a, a bit vector, that can represent an encoding. Well, if you think of that an encoding as being representational of something, that was the original word. That was our that was our binary words. So hence words are 16 bits. That meant when we doubled the size of our memory space, when we went from a 16-bit microprocessor to a 32-bit processor, we suddenly went from words to double words. So we so if a word is 16 bits, a double word is 32 bits. Then when we evolve to a 64-bit memory addressable space where we can represent 64-bit vectors, that now became a quad word. Hence you see the artifice, which is our linguistics. We built atomically off of word and just kept doubling that up as we doubled up the register space. And so that is going to have consequences 
on the way we name our registers and the way we name our instructions that move things in and out of our registers. Okay, so now let's map these data types that exist at the machine level to the data types that are a high level representation. So if a car, so car is a bike. Well, that doesn't even meet the standards of a word. That's still just a bike. Our sort is a word representation, right? Um, which back when the microprocessor, when 8086 came out, that was as big as you could have an uh, integer value, right? It was your shorts. That's why they still exist. Backwards compatibility. Uh, then you have your int. That was a big thing to be able to increase the size of your integer space. That's your double word, which is also represented with an L, right? So B is for byte, W is for word. Number of bytes is on this column. Ls represent your double words. And then finally, your um, your quad words are represented with a, K, a Q. Now, we have our integer types, which have their own register space. And then you have your own precision register spaces. We said that that was introduced in, uh, was that, that was a 486? Or that introduced the, or was it 386? I forget now. Um, I think it was the 486. I think 386 um, I, uh, brought the 32-bit uh, architecture and the 486 brought the floating point representation in unit on our processor, which results in actually having a data type dedicated to our floating point. We had our single precision and our double precision. And notice our double precision is represented with an L versus an S here. And again, all the corresponding byte sizes are here in this chart. Okay, so now that we know what are the fundamental data types, and so now we're in such an abstract level at the machine code level, we just talked in things in terms of size of bit sequences, right? We don't even provide a context. The idea of having context is a higher level thing. That's like a C code thing. At the at the uh, at the assembly level, we just treat things as sequences of bits, and so that's so our data format, our data types represent that. The amount of context that we understand our representation to have is inclusive to the data format at any given level. So the higher we go up, the more definitive we can be about the context that those bits represent. The more lower we go down to the hardware level, the more it just becomes an abstract set of binary values. So with that said, we have instructions that allows us to start moving our bits around our system. And again, if we wanna move a byte versus a word versus a double word, an L, or a quad word, a Q, we actually can append the data type to the move command. And this lets the system know how much, what size bit vector you intend to actually move in to memory or into the register space. So again, this is a key concept, the ability to access information, right? That's one of the fundamental concepts our system has to provide for us if we wanted to do interesting things, if we want to support high level language, we want to uh, support software development. How big is this? I think we'll probably run through this and then we'll be done for today. Okay, so just a quick gander at introducing how we access information. Again, all of this is predicated off of that x86-64 um, architecture. So it was derived from Intel CPU design from 16-bit to 32-bit to 64-bit on how we move things around our system. Right, because that represents the hardware state, and that's what we're tethered to on our system. So uh, the, the, um, because of the ISA design, it provides to us 16 general purpose registers, which I'm sure you've had chances to go over already in assembly. That would be like your RAX, RVX, RCX. And so your registers can be used, say, for instance, for integer data, 
It can hold whole numbers for uh, arithmetic or other operations. You can use it for pointers to reference memory locations because guess what? That's saved as hexadecimal. Is that's also saved as integer data as well, right? It's a hexadecimal representation. All memory addresses start as actually as unsigned values. So very powerful. It allows us to either store primitive data in terms of numbers, or those numbers can represent memory addresses where something else more abstract can reside in. Now let's talk a quick brief mention of the history of the evolution of our registers. We start with 18, uh, eight 16-bit registers. Now you remember AX, BX, CX were all the original names for our 16-bit register space. And then that could be subdivided, right, to be two different byte representations. You had your AL and your AH, right? AL is the lower end of your 16-bit register, and AH is the higher end of your 16-bit register. Did you, you remember that? Okay, great. So then we extend that to 32-bit, which is going to be our EAX, extended AX, EB, EBP, extended BP. So we're going to take 16 bits and put another 16 bits in front, and we've extended it. Then finally, we introduce 64-bit, where we are going to prefix it with an R instead. And so that's going to extend it again from 32-bit to 64-bit. Now, in addition to, uh, to um, extending it to 64-bit, we also got eight new registers as well. So this graphic illustrates this evolution from size, from AL to AX to EAX to RAX or all the other registers that we have available to us. So again, since we started at 16-bit, we moved to 32-bit, we moved to 64-bit, and even at 16-bit, you could have data like cars, which existed at 8-bit segments. You have the ability to access at the AL and AH level, the H and L level. Then that means we have byte level operations at a machine code uh, basis, 16-bit operations, 32-bit operations, and 64-bit operations. Again, what I'm trying to impress upon you is these are data formatted concepts. Just like we said that you have the idea of like um, casting with higher level of things, where things had to be the same data type for you to operate on them. It's the same thing at the machine code level. It's just our data formats have less context. So we're operating on things at how big is the bit vector? But when we operate on things, we want to do it at a byte level size, 16-bit size, 32-bit size, or 64-bit size. You're conformed to the data format. Very abstract notion, but it's the same kind of rules you would expect at a higher level system. And so there's, there's implications there. If you're doing something at a 32-bit operation, it's just talking about the least four significant bits, the least two significant bytes, or the least significant byte versus accessing your entire register space. And so the general rule up to 32 bits was that uh, the remaining bytes on one or two byte quantities remained unchanged. We saw that when we were looking at the integer value stuff as the binary representation. But something really wacky happened when we went from 32 bits to 64 bits. Here, the upper four bytes are set to zero. When you do a four byte quantity, an operation on a 64 bit system, you should understand that that has a consequence. And that was a convention that had that x86 that um that had uh, was adopted. Okay, let's see how much more. Okay, so let me get through these last couple, and then I'll be done. The important registers that you should be aware of: the first and for foremost is going to be your stack pointer. The purpose of that is going to indicate the end position of your runtime stack. That's what controls what's happening in terms of your memory space. So when calling a function, RSP is adjusted to make room for your local variables and saved registers. Uh, your other 15 registers are generally used for storing things like temporary data, function arguments, and more. We'll talk more about that next class. And just understand that all instructions can use any register interchangeably. Some instructions purposely use a register as like an accumulator or as a counter. Right. So when you call a specific operation inside of your instruction set, it can have consequences on producing a result that's going to overwrite whatever's in that space. So you should be well aware if you're going to do any kind of assembly 
programming of what each instruction does destructively, how it's going to change your state in a way that can compromise data you want it to save for future use, which is why it's so important to know how to use your stack point so that you can archive that stuff. And so the last thing I just want to mention is that in terms of the programming conventions for the registers, we will use functions will use your registers to manage the stack, to pass arguments to another function or to get a returning value from a function that it was calling to do work. That's how registers are actually used for kind of interfacing between function calls in our client server model. And then on top of that, the registers are used for storage. It's used to store local data that your function might use. It can be used just to store temporary data, like inside of a loop, for instance, for your loop control variable. And so we'll pick up from here with our operand specifiers uh, next class. I will, so I will, uh, I will talk about the midterm on Wednesday, Kenneth. So there was a question about the midterm. I will actually produce the document so that you can all start working on that and I'll issue it out to you all on Wednesday. Thank you for reminding me, or you didn't remind me, but thank you for reminding me to tell the rest of the class that. <laughs>